Now, we come to the next part of my talk here, which is the question, is it that if one touches the spiritual core, one becomes uh, um, crazy, or one is not able to survive in this world, or work in this world? Is it that one loses all interest in life and continues to live in a forest? Or is it that with a changed and transformed mind, you can come back into the world and do better things, even when in the material point of view? Because you discover the source of energy which is in us as infinite, not finite. You know, the, in our ancient Vedas, the rishis call human beings amritasya putraha, oh, sons of immortality. Well, you can say sons and daughters of immortality. Well, so, there is an element of the immortal, all-powerful being in every one of us, in our hearts. Hmm? There was another yogi, I say yogi, somebody may say something else, who walked the streets of Galilee a thousand years ago, with Jerusalem. He said something very significant, which is the essence of Vedanta. He said, lay treasures in your heart where thieves do not break in and steal. So, inside us, there is a spark of the divine, and that is same for every human being. Poor, rich, old, young, male, female, any nationality, any race. That divine spark in us is a part of the all-pervading Supreme Being and therefore potentially has all that the Supreme Reality has, potentially. Right now it's potential, it's not been explored and opened. This is the great message of the Upanishads. You're not just limited human being who will born one day and die the next, or die after a few days. But in you is an element which is never born and therefore is never going to die. And it's that essence, which is your spiritual essence, which so the Vedanta calls the Atman, the inner self. And it's the essence because of which our mind operates. Um, I've been having a series of discussions and talks on exploring consciousness with one of the uh, pioneer institutes of science in India, the Indian Institute of Technology, in Delhi, in New Delhi. If you go on to the YouTube and check, you'll find the talks there, exploring consciousness. I'm trying to say that it's not the brain that produces consciousness, but the brain is a very complex organism through which the consciousness works. Even if you don't have a brain, this consciousness works. A tree, you cannot locate a brain in the tree, right? But if there is no sunlight, the branches move towards the sun. You can't locate a brain there. Why? Because it's also conscious. If there's no water, then the roots search for the water and go there. You can't locate a brain. Which means consciousness operates even if there is no structure called the brain. Luckily, we have a very complex system called the brain through which our consciousness operates. Which is why we are able to turn within and discover our true identity. But we are not this body which is coming and going, but something beyond. Now just see how, what a liberating message this is of the Upanishads. You are not this little thing that you think you are. You are much more than what, and than that. It's a message of hope. During this time we passed through the pandemic, you know, 
lots of people were suffering and they were worried about living in solitude. They called it, uh, not solitude, but lockdown. Mm -hmm. So I was all the time on online talking to people and telling them, listen, you may be in a imposed lockdown, but in ancient times, many uh, saints and holy men deliberately and voluntarily locked themselves up so that they could learn things. Utilize your time now. Don't, don't think, oh, I'm an, I said, change the word uh, aloneness, loneliness to solitude. The word solitude is a sacred word. It means you have time and you have the opportunity to explore yourself. When you're outside in the outside world all the time, your mind is going out through the five senses and you cannot explore your inner being. So I said, consider this as an opportunity. You know the moth that, um, the worm that walks on the soil, the silkworm, then it decides to build itself a cocoon. So it works very hard building a cocoon around it. And then it sets inside in solitude for some time. And then what happens? The cocoon breaks. And then what happens? This little worm that was crawling in the soil has now become a beautiful butterfly. Colored wings flying up into the horizon. So consider such situations to be solitude given to you, without your choice maybe, to understand yourself, then the whole thing changes. Okay, so having, I must come back to where I left. What is it that we all seek? Now wait, I will, uh, you know my mind doesn't work in a straight line. <laughs> it's like a fuzzy logic. Mm -hmm. Here a little, there a little, here there. I think that's the way one should be, but when we are taught in school, A, hey, go this way, it's linear. Uh, anyway, the truth is not linear. You know why? <laughs> because if truth is here, and I am here, if I have to reach, I need to go in a linear way. What if it is everywhere? How do I do that? <laughs> Suppose it's everywhere, it's all pervading. How do I move towards it? When all movement stops, it is there. <laughs> you, know, you get what I'm trying to say. When all movement stops and then still, then you discover that. And then you discover that which is here is also there. Okay. So, there's a beautiful uh, sloka in the Upanishads one of the most beautiful. In India we chant it many times, but don't think that we understand what we're chanting. Unfortunately, few people know Sanskrit now. It's strange. So you must have heard this in India or in other religious ashrams, this mantra, before we start meditation and so on, we chant this mantra. It's Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamaduchate, Purnasya Purnamataya Purnameva Vasishyate. Which means, the Rishi of the Upanishad says, Purnamata, all that we have here started from there and that is completeness. Completeness, Purna. Say so the origin of this world is completeness. But we are always incomplete, right? We don't feel complete. The whole of life and evolution is how to become more complete, how to become more. But there's nothing wrong, I'm just saying facts. So we feel we are inadequate, so we need to have things to become adequate. We feel we are empty, so we like to fill ourselves. We feel that we are conditioned, so we want to uncondition ourselves. For example, I have one car, for some time I'm happy because I was using a bike and then, I know, you ask some bikers, they would say they're happy with a the bike than a car. Anyway, so 
and then I am happy for a while and then after some time either I want two cars or I need to change my model. It goes on and on and on. I might at some point have a Rolls Royce um, or beyond a silver ghost. But it doesn't stop there. If I see a sheikh going in a different car, I think, oh, this is better than mine. Why is this? Because deep down in the mind, there is this understanding that we need to expand and go back to that full fullness, to the purna. It's built in our consciousness. We're not satisfied with this little. We need to grow. Because we know somewhere deep down in the subconscious, that we originate from fullness. But I look and find that, oh, I'm not full. I'm always empty. I need to fill myself. Well, if you're totally empty, no problem. But you know what I mean. Hmm? I'm alone today and I'm enjoying life. And I think perhaps if I get married, my life would expand. <laughs> well, try it out. I'm a married man myself. So... Well, it's good, but it also has its problems. <laughs> You're not complete because of that or anything else. Or I say, if I have a child, it's my extension, so I've grown. But the child is an independent entity. He goes off after a while. You're left where you are. But <coughs> the subconscious earns to grow because deep down it knows it comes from fullness from completeness. It's trying to fulfill that completeness in some way or the other. Hmm? So, while the Upanishad says Purnamada, the good news is that it also says Purnamidam. You are also complete. This is also complete. But I don't see it. I see only the incompleteness. So, if we turn within and look at the mind, our own mind. Only the mind can look at the mind. Others cannot look at your mind. My mind can look at my mind. I find that there is always inadequacy, incompleteness, unfulfilled desires. Because all of us are looking for happiness. What is the aim of life? Somebody asked me, what is the aim of life? I said, what, is, what do you think? Well, I said, to have to build a career, to have... I said, yeah, but for what? Mm. I said, to be more happy. So, all of us, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. We all want to be happy. The only problem is we think you add more things and you become happy. Well, this is to be discussed a little more. Do we really? get happy by adding more things because the Upanishad says let go and rejoice. Te na tyakte na bhunjita, let go and rejoice. Let go doesn't mean give up. Not saying all of you should go back home, sell all your cars and keep on. It's not what I'm trying to say. The attitude of mind. But it's true that all of us are looking for happiness. Now they used to live a uh, we were saint in India, whose name was Kabir Das. He gave a beautiful example in his poems about a creature called the musk deer. I don't know if you've heard of a musk deer. Uh, the musk that you get in your perfumes comes from a particular kind of deer, short one, that lives in the Himalayas, upper Himalayas. It has a pouch under its abdomen, which every year at a certain point produces musk. And when the musk comes, it's a beautiful fragrance in the air, lovely fragrance of musk. But the poor deer, here I mean D-E-A-R, the poor deer goes looking for the source of this fragrance wondering where it's coming from, not knowing that it's coming from its underbelly. Kavi said that is the problem. It's quite legitimate. Everybody is searching for happiness, of course, normal. 
But the source of that happiness is not dependent on anything outside, is inside, like the musk deer. Turns out, but no musk deer has ever found out that it's coming from here. But we are in a good position to find out that it comes from here. Hmm. Well, you can say here or here or whatever. So, this turning within and looking is when you find that what you are searching for outside is inside us. Hmm. Now, um, what does the great Patanjali, the teacher of the original teacher of yoga, say about this matter. The definition of yoga, apart from the yogic exercises, doing asanas and all that, the true essence of yoga, according to Patanjali, is yoga's chitta vritti nirodha, which means yoga is the stilling or the overcoming of all the distractions of the mind stuff. Mm, our mind, how it runs. Uh, one minute it's here and the next minute it is there. I think I'm going to meditate calmly, then comes this thought. Uh, it disturbs my calmness. Could be uh, somebody playing loud music in the next door or whatever. It doesn't stop there. I go there and throw a stone. And <laughs> so, mm, this mind is always moving, up or down. One minute it's here, next minute it is gone. And is always worried about whether it would lose its grip on life. And happiness is so rare that when it comes, we want to hold on to it. The moment you hold on to something, half the happiness is lost, right? You're no longer free. So Patanjali says, the essence of yoga is how to stop the distractions of the mind. And the entire practice of yoga is to theoretically understand that what you seek can be found within. And therefore, turn the mind within without allowing it to be disturbed by the outward factors. You can live this life, of course, but make sure that you don't unnecessarily disturb. You know, you can't find out how good or how calm you are if you stay in isolation. Mm, Babaji told me once, I said, I want to stay in the cave and meditate and forever. And he said, are you a stupid idiot? He said, he was very rough with me. He said, listen, you, med you stay in a cave for 10 years, okay? And you meditate 10 hours. And then at the end of 10 years, you say, well, I'm a good man, now I'm free, I'm purified, I have no jealousy, I have no anger. He said, with whom? There's nobody in the cave. <laughs> what are you jealous of? <laughs> Who are you angry with? He said, you leave the cave and get into the bus, somebody gives you a kick on your foot, especially with a stiletto heel, and then you know where you stand, <laughs> right? It's only in communication with others that you really realize what you are. The communication with the world outside gives you the picture of where you stand. Then you discover that, yes, my mind is distracted. And the definition of yoga is to free the mind from all distractions. When the mind is freed of all distractions, it becomes calm and quiet absolutely quiet. And that quietness is the tarmac from which you can take off to the higher levels of consciousness. Where you discover that you're not this limited little human being, but something beyond. There was a great yogi, must have heard all of you, at least some of you, called Swami Vivekananda. Somebody asked him in England when he was lecturing, is meditation a form of self-hypnosis? He said, to be true, I must say that 
meditation is dehypnosis. He said, you have been hypnotized into believing from your birth that you are so and so, you are this much, you are small, you know. Uncondition your mind from this and understand that in true essence, when the mind is calm and quiet, and is not distracted, you are actually the all-pervading blissful self. This unconditioning is what meditation is all about. And all other steps lead to that. So it's a message of hope. It's a message that no matter where you are in this world or in your status or whatever, deep down you're a spark of that infinite divinity. And when you touch that, you also begin to understand that your potential is infinite. You can no longer think, oh, I can't do this. You can do it. If you only say that, yes, I can do it. Why? Because in you, as a spark of that all-pervading supreme reality, therefore the Upanishads declared, Tattvamasi, you are that. You are not this, but you are much more than this, you are that. And what is the characteristics of a person who has touched that? A person who has touched that can fit in anywhere, wear any clothes. Oh, well, you may not even wear clothes. There are some who don't. Hmm? And his mind would always be tranquil. Tranquility under all circumstances. And this tranquil mind attracts infinite energy. And this infinite energy will be used in the right way because this person who has touched the core doesn't want anything from anybody. They would rather get someone to get what they want rather than what you want. This is the essence of the teachings of the Upanishads. This is what this boy, who was once a boy, well, I'm still sometimes boyish, but uh, as a boy, learned with the great teacher, Maheshwar Nath Babaji. And therefore, the job he gave me was, first he said, don't open your mouth. You don't know enough. So, till the age of 40, I shut my mouth. I didn't speak, I didn't talk to, there were no public talk, nothing. I used to go and listen to others speaking and sometimes wonder Maybe I should point out this guy saying something stupid, but then Babaji said, <laughs> keep your mouth shut. So I... <laughs> and then he said, I'm, I'll give you a green signal when you start. So I was actually thinking, I hope this green signal never comes. Because I was leading a happy life. <laughs> uh, and I knew when the green signal comes, I need to forget things and get out and do things which are not very good for the family. My, you know, you keep traveling, you do this, you do. And even then, for a long time, I was quietly sitting in a corner of a place called Madanabali, which is in the south in Andhra Pradesh, till I wrote the autobiography. <laughs> and Babaji had said, write the autobiography, so I wrote it. And then the circus started. So I, I was waiting for the green signal. And one day, when I was 41, I think I, this is the green signal. Because somebody came to me and said, we heard that you've gone to the Himalayas. I said, yes, sir, I've gone to the Himalayas. So can you come and talk about your Himalayan trip? Uh, and there were a small audience in the Theosophical Society. Uh, so I he said small audience, so I went there and there were a hundred people sitting. And I'm wondering, what do I say to these guys now? <laughs> and then I said, Baba has given me a signal now, so I should So I explained, I forgot the crowd, I the person in front of me and said to this guy, it's a good technique, a big crowd and you know, Forget about others, talk to the person sitting in front of you. So
so i himalayan natural can't talk my himalayan adventure without baba ji my so the master also came into it and then tanar oh that was nice so can we repeat it on sunday this is how the started then of course so to sum up today's uh, uh interaction we need to shed this thought that we are uh, tiny little uh, puppets controlled by somebody and that we can't do anything on our own and that happiness depends on external factors and that deep down is the treasure in us which can be explored and if i can explore it and i did explore it you can too this is the message i have and it doesn't require you to change your robes change your hair style last time i came i had my hair all tied up I cut it off too difficult to handle huh i don't know ladies do it i don't know how but uh out of time and also no matter what where you started your background or your family you can still go there it's open to all this door is open to all the key is discrimination one point in attention and the desire to move forward and find the treasure that is in your heart um some of the things that happen when this i'm telling you from my experience is that no matter what the outward circumstances are you're tranquil uh i've gone to places where people can't break out what this guy is talking about see they stand up and ask stupid questions sometimes not all sometimes they're why 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 and sometimes they insult you so called insult right i don't find any insult mm. um if you call me a fool for instance and if i don't know english what does it matter to me no <laughs> <laughs> uh, if i know hindi i might think you're calling me a fool which is a flower and be very happy about it yeah. it all depends on how you take it not on what somebody is doing or saying right it's how you react to it so what does it mean the important thing is your own mind either get destroyed by it or use it as a beautiful tool and grow expand your mind make it quiet and calm and tranquil and when this happens you're in touch with divinity the divine then lives in you and therefore the corollary to this is if i discover that there is a divine in everybody's heart i discover maybe you don't know but i know if i know then i see everybody as a walking temple of god of divinity let's not use the word god because uh who's this guy is written Uh, a book recently richard dawkins the god illusion so let's not use the word god so divinity let's say he didn't he didn't say divinity he said god hmm. so deep down when you realize this divine then you're also all one because you can't be different outwardly yes but internally you cannot be because you've come from the same source you go back to the same source you live with the same source you are the same energy of the universe working through small points i rest my case <laughs> now thank you now we can have some interaction you can call me a fool <laughs> Is it, is it necessary to realize fully to see my past lives 
Is it something that I've been required to do? Your attention and spiritual life, according to me, should be to find your true essence and find the divinity in you and therefore relate to the world as parts of divinity. This is all you need to do. Whether you need to know about your past lives and things like that. I think if you go deep enough and if you expand your consciousness, it automatically will happen. You don't have to put your energy into that. Put your energy into the most important thing, that is to find yourself, your inner self. This is the most important thing. If you do that, no matter which method you follow, see, the, the only problem is that the spiritual uh, life is not some kind of a window shopping, like mm, something from here, something from there. It's not Walmart. So. Although, unfortunately, it's become like Walmart nowadays. But uh, it's better to stick with whatever you're doing and give complete attention to it and move forward. I think that would be better than keep changing. You know, when you dig for water, when you make a, a bore, you can't keep drilling everywhere 10 feet, 5 feet. You never get water. Go deep within. Go 200 feet, 300 feet. Sometimes the water table is very low these days, the spiritual water table. So go down. <laughs> and <laughs> so even after 300 feet, you don't get water. Then look for the other. You know what I mean? Yes, sir? Kriya Yuka. OK. Uh, in Sanskrit, it comes from the ancient Sanskrit, the word kriya means a technique. Okay, It's a technique. So any technique, like any technique that you have to do something in physics or chemistry, or in the same way, any technique that takes you deep into yourself and uh, find your true essence, any technique, I'm not saying only what I teach, any technique, can be called kriya. Now, the science of yoga has many such techniques, okay? And it comes from different traditions, because each person must have taught in a different way for different people. When I say Kriya, I'm talking about that particular technique which has come down from someone who we call Sri Guru Babaji, and who Yogananda Paramahamsa called Mahavzar Babaji, not two different beings. And to me, it has come directly from Maheshwaranath Babaji, to me, my, my master. So th when I say Kriya, it is this particular Kriya. That doesn't mean that other Kriyas don't exist. There are many Kriyas. So what does it do? I'm, now I can only talk about what my Kriya. I, I'm not about to teach you Kriya, but I'll explain to you what it uh, <clears throat> according to the yogic anatomy and physiology, very, very close to Gray's anatomy, a little bit different. A um, little bit. The human body has a lot of energy, which we call in yogic terms or in Sankhya terms, uh, prana, prana. Now, prana is the energy that courses through our body doing various functions, digestion, waking, sleeping, eating, and everything. Now, of these different channels through which the energy circulates in the body, even the arteries and the veins, they're all passages, channels through which energy circulates. There are three important ones. I'm talking from the point of view of Kriya. In fact, from the point of yogic science, uh, of these three are most important. And the three are, on the left side, is what we call the Ida channel, Ida Nadi. We call it Nadi. And the right is the uh, Pingala Nadi. And in the center of the spine, 
starting from the bottom of your spine till the cerebrum is a channel inside the spine called the Shushumna. Now for most purposes it is enough if the energy prana and that particular prana which we call mukhya prana, the important prana, moves to the ida and the pingala. You can say that in anatomy it looks like they are very similar or correspond to the ganglionic chain on both sides of the autonomous nervous system. The central nervous system is what we are dealing with, which is the shushun. Now, according to yogic science, according to not only Kriya Yoga, but according to the Yoga Pradipika and various other textbooks on yoga, what the yogi is attempting to do is to bring the left side charge or energy and the right side energy together at the bottom of the spine like you bring two wires in which there is the cathode and the anode and then rub them together. There's a spark. Now, the yogi tries to take the spark through the central nervous system. Now, for all other purposes, including learning nuclear physics or whatever you want to learn, it's enough if the prana goes through the ida and the pingala. But if you want to look beyond the ordinary dimension, beyond the scope of your five senses, then the energy has to go through the shushumna. And there are different ways and means by which this energy can be made to ascend uh, the shushumna. And for that, the first requisite, of course, is to clean the shushumna. It's usually full of muck. Mark meaning all the things that we have collected in life or in negative emotions. The yogis say also from your past. But the first step in Kriya is a technique by which you clean the Shushumna. It's like a small, tiny channel, uh, like the uh, similar to the spinal cord, very, very tiny. And when this happens, then your awareness is lifted from the gross to the subtle, to the subtle, to the subtle. Finally, when it reaches here, then the yogi discovers for himself that life is much more than what he thought it was. And the experience is so blissful that he's not very, uh, he doesn't care much if the little joys of life aren't there because you've come to the essence of all joy. Now the technique, why is it called a technique? Because it's also understood that your prana is linked to your breath and therefore there's a certain breathing technique plus something else, chanting of a sound by which the energy is made to go up the shushumna. This technique is called kriya. And the particular type of kriya which I teach is from this tradition but there are other kriyas also. Like bhastrika, breathing in and out, is also considered a kriya, hyperventilation. So there are many kriyas. And anybody who is sincere and who is ready to practice every day, also who is ready to follow at least some set of rules in life, basic thing is the middle path, which means no excess, neither too much nor too little, somewhere in between. So there are a set of laws called the yamas and niyamas to be followed, which are also there in the Ashtanga Yoga. Following this, if a person sits down and does his practices regularly, with guidance of course, because you are on largely unexplored territory, so it helps. <clears throat> then, depending on various factors, success is assured whether it will happen in two days or two years depends on many factors, of which one could be not regular practice, the other could be some obstacles which are psychological, and so on and so forth. This is the answer to your question. Oh, okay. Have you had any of your students become enlightened? <laughs> so how many? 
can you give me those papers? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Have you had any of your students become enlightened? If so, how many? <laughs> now, when I teach Kriya, please make, the, I'm going to make this very clear. I don't say that only those who practice the Kriya that I teach can become enlightened. So I may be knowing people who are not doing any Kriya, but might be enlightened. <coughs> kriya is a step-by-step -step systematic way. I understand that, and I would defend it because it's my uh, tradition. <laughs> but I don't, uh, there are great people who have attained enlightenment without practicing maybe this particular Kriya. They may be doing something else because Kriya simply means a technique. There is a technique of self-introspection, like Ramana Maharshi didn't do any breathing exercises. He just one day discovered that he was not the body but beyond. This is possible. And someone who has complete devotion to his deity can also attain this enlightenment. Uh, but if you ask me how many of your students have become you know, unfortunately, nowadays there are not many students. They're all gurus. <laughs> so I, it's like asking somebody, how many gurus do you think are? I don't know. So, uh, well, some of my students are very sincere, I can assure you. There are some people here also sitting somewhere who have taken Kriya from me four years ago, five years ago, and haven't practiced. So I don't know whether they are enlightened. The hope is that they would be enlightened. It, you can't count because there is no such criteria by which you can measure and weigh and take out. Uh, but I'm only hoping that if somebody becomes really enlightened and discovers this divine spark in himself, um, it'll be good. I'm actually looking for somebody like that. I'm 72 now, I need to retire. <laughs> Believe me, I've been looking with a magnifying glass, I haven't found any. <laughs> you have to take the process. <laughs> 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 Application process is this. <laughs> mm -hmm. So this question I can't answer. Uh, if they feel they're enlightened, they would, and you don't, I need, don't need to certify this. And uh, so on. And I'm glad if at all there is someone who has, there might be, they have not begun to teach, which is a good point. Mm -hmm. As a yogi, how do you experience anger? How do you manage when confronted with anger? What is the distinction between passion, anger, and love? Good question. Well, as a yogi, how do you experience anger? Well, if anger does not come, you don't experience it. Honestly. But sometimes you can see it slowly sprouting. Even for yogis, it can happen. But you, the difference is, the person who is not a yogi can't find it when it's just sprouting. He finds it when it is fully expressed. All a yogi's minds become so sharp and sensitive, as soon as there is this anger sprouting, you catch it there and nip it in the bud. I can't say that I'm entirely fair, but I know that it's of no use to anybody. It's harmful to you and it's harmful to me. This is understood. Once this is understood deeply, then there are many factors which can produce anger of which the ego is the one. Like I said, somebody called me a fool. I got angry. How can I be a fool? I'm not, you know. So this is how I deal. When Even if something happens and if there's a little sprout coming up, I nip it in the bud and say, ah, 
not good for you. Also, I find out, I have found out that anger is also bad for physical health. Mm, keep getting angry and see how your BP goes up, your blood pressure goes up, how every system in the body, you know what, what happens when you're angry? More adrenaline is pumped into the bloodstream. While this can cause action, it can also cause violent action, also. And therefore, it is always detrimental to your life. However, sometimes you need to pretend to be angry in this life. Otherwise, you can't get work done. <laughs> Believe me, I know this. Except that very soon people realize that he's pretending to be angry. <laughs> so it's gone again. But anger certainly is not a good thing for us. If it's a moral question of is it okay to get angry, if there is nothing immoral about it. I feel I'm, it's not, I'm not justified in what somebody did to me. I get angry. I'm, it's not. It's not that way evil, but it's certainly something that we can do without and treat it as a, as a, a symptom of a deep lying disease and try to cut it when it comes. That's how I handle it. Rarely it comes now, rarely. Uh, yeah. There's one more here, sir. So I've already answered that. So what is the distinction between passion, anger, and love? Well, anger has nothing to do with passion. Love perhaps has to do with passion. When love is deep, very, very deep, it's difficult to define love actually. You cannot cultivate love. How can you cultivate love? It's not something to be, you can't put fertilizers and pour water and cultivate. Either it is there or it's not there. Love is a natural feeling. And that when it becomes all consuming, then it's called passion. You're right, sometimes the passion can be negative and sometimes it can be positive. And it's the yogi's job to develop the positive passion and try to sideline negative passion. And without passion, you cannot do a thing really. You should have passion. The fire has to be there, like the fire of desire. Mm. He was fired with enthusiasm to do something. It has to be there. But the problem is I'm fired with the desire, with the, with the passion to do something, but when somebody else is doing that, I feel it's a competition. This is the problem. Then anger comes. I want to be the only one with passion. Impossible. So if you look at it that way, Perhaps passion can be a very important part of your life without its negative contents. Did you say something? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I was just going to ask, is there a such thing as like divine anger? Or <laughs> divine, you know what I mean? I, I, I can tell you something. I lived with a man who was a fully established yogi but who didn't have any possessions or belongings except his water pot. Never got into a vehicle, he always walked. And he didn't even have footwear. He had no banners. He had no internet, he had nothing. <laughs> At least I have YouTube. <laughs> and iTube and so on. But um, this a kind of man like that. Sometimes I must say that he used to be upset with me. I can call that anger, but I always would like to call it divine anger because he was angry not because he didn't get anything, but because I was not moving forward. He, his anger, I don't know whether to call it anger, was directed against making me better, not for any selfish purpose. That, I think, cannot really be put into the bracket of anger. Because I was such a stupid idiot that now, I no, really, seriously, I, I, 
when I think in the retrospect, then silly questions I've asked in my things. Now I regret for it sometimes. Why did I could have done something better? But then, generally, as a rule, he was never angry with me. Sometimes. One day, uh, we were sitting and talking, and he said, okay, so after a while, you have to go down to the plains and start teaching. I said, why? Why would I go back to that muck back? Why don't I stay here with you, wandering? Huh? Nice, there's no agenda. There's no, uh, I know that it was kind of a laziness seeping in also in a way. Uh, fresh air in the Himalayas, lovely water in the Ganga, food, you get somewhere from ashram, somewhere. So why would I go back to this muck? He said, go back, get married, have a family. said, stop. I don't want to do this. He gave up. Second day again he told me. And then when I said the same thing, he said, his face suddenly turned red and I thought he's going to give me some one slap, which he has done. I value the slap. It has taught me many things. Anyway, so he said, you remember when you first came here, after one year, I asked you, um, what do you think of yourself in relation to me? What do you think of yourself? I said, yeah, you asked me. And what did you reply? I said, I'm your puppy dog, <laughs> sitting here and looking at you, drinking in your words sometimes barking and whimpering, hmm. but I'm your puppy dog. He said, you said that? I said, I said that. And what did I say? I remembered. He said, ah, you may be my puppy dog, but don't wag your tail too much. He said, did, you, did I say that? I said, yes, you said that. So he said, now don't wag your tail and do exactly what I said. Then his voice became very loud, and I thought, my God, something is going to happen. You call, can call that anger, but I would call it divine anger. <laughs> it was for me, not for him, you see. So, sorry to interrupt. Happiness is a divine blessing. That's what I was talking about. Happiness? It's a divine blessing. Of course it is. So we cannot cultivate it ourselves. We have to you cannot cultivate. You have to find it. And all cultivation is how to take away the obstacles to this happiness, which is right inside us, in our hearts. The Supreme Being sits inside our heart as the Antaryami. To discover this, we have to put in effort. If you put in effort, then there is grace. You see, the grace is like, it's always present. It's not as if it's not there. It's like the, the wind, you know, which is there everywhere. But our windows and doors are all shut. So even when the wind blows, it doesn't come inside. We have our ACs, right? We don't open the windows. It's air conditioner. So we're actually conditioned. Anyway, so when we open the doors and windows, you cannot say, you cannot dictate the grace, the wind has to come now. Mm? We can't do that. But we can open the windows and doors. This is sadhana, spiritual practice. Leave it open. The breeze of grace will come. When it comes, let it not find your windows closed. This is... Guru Kripa works in health. Just now what I was talking was Guru Kripa. <laughs> I always think if Babaji had not put his hand on my head at the age of nine, I would have still remained the same little fellow I was there. There would have been no change. It's there. But you also need to put in your effort. If you put in your effort, the breeze will certainly blow. Keep your windows open. Keeping your windows open is your effort. Oh, there are some more written in. 
How do I know if my ephemeral life force is being used for its greatest good? First of all, what is this ephemeral life force? <laughs> I don't know who wrote this. Mm. Hmm? Say that again. Energy within us. How do I know if my, oh, this is the meaning of life, my life force, is being used for its greatest good. As long as it's not being used to do good to others and is only used to do good to myself, it's not doing good. It's not being used properly. The first thing that happens when you touch the source is that you develop compassion. It's not cultivated. It happens. You know, there's this beautiful concept among the Buddhists. Beautiful concept. Um, a person who attains freedom, nirvana, who's attained sunyata, in Tibetan terminology is called an arhant. Master, perfect master, arhant. That's one section. There's another person who has attained nirvana. He has stepped across the border and seen what is there. His one foot is still in this earth. And then he stops and says, no, I'm not putting the other foot there. I need to go back and get at least one person with me into nirvana. And knowing pretty well that if I go back and come in a human body, then I have to suffer and all these things. But he decides, doesn't matter. I still would like to go and bring at least one person into nirvana. Such people are called bodhisattvas. They're rare. It's very easy to call somebody a bodhisattva, but it's very rare. Where you're not there anymore, you don't care. You want the other person to come. And the, 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 the Mahayana theory is that I'm neither a Mahayanist nor a Hinayanist, I'm just telling you. Uh, the Mahayana theory is that all persons on this earth may at some point have been your own mother in, your re in the rebirth cycle. Who knows? So you're actually taking your mother to salvation. <laughs> what better thing can you do? Such are called the bodhisattvas. it's not easy to be a bodhisattva because the bliss and the and the uh, state of nirvana is such that nobody wants to go back it's very rare letting go of long challenging marriage to move forward peacefully now i won't interfere in anybody's marital bliss. <laughs> I don't know what to say because I don't know the whole story. Um, I refuse to comment on this. But well, if both parties are willing and if they think they will be happier leading separate lives, I don't see anything wrong in this. I don't know the situation. It's a loaded question, that's what I mean. <laughs> And I especially don't want somebody to go and say, yes, I'm walking away. <laughs> Why? Because Sri M said that it is OK. <laughs> we need to look at it carefully. <laughs> Can I and my future partner take Kriya initiation tomorrow? Future partner? The partner is coming with you or no? I don't know, I'm just asking. Oh, okay. So have you understood roughly what Kriya is all about? Have you read my autobiography? Okay. All right. So if you're really serious, but believe me, it's not a magic thing. 
that you take the Kriya tomorrow and day after tomorrow Nirvana. No. <laughs> we can't say. We don't know who you actually are, how many births you, we don't know. So it all depends on various factors. But if you sincerely practice, I think it will work. There's no harm. What do you mean future partner? <laughs> you are going to. I hope it doesn't interfere with marriage. <laughs> huh? No. Okay. Good. If, you see, it's nice if a couple practices the same spiritual technique. Then each help each other. If one is doing something else, then it becomes a problem. So if both of you are interested, I see that you're interested, I think. So let's work on this. But practice regularly. Now here is a question which uh, is, uh, requires a large, a big answer, a big discussion. So I don't know how, how do you feel about fear that I can, uh, I can discuss, but how do you define God? Hmm? How do I define God? If I define God, it's my definition of God. You define God. It's your definition of God. Which means what? The word God is something beyond any definitions. Uh, from my understanding, it's that supreme reality that pervades everything. And the moment we start defining it with our limited intellect, it's gone. The idea is to go beyond your ordinary mind, and then you probably know what it is. If you know probably, you probably if you know what it is, you will find it very difficult to tell it to somebody else. Because the moment you put in words and definitions, it's, it melts away. There's no, it's not there anymore. So the, I cannot define it. The very fact that I cannot define it, that is God. You know what I mean? Um, because different people define this in different ways. Yet that entity does not change. It's the same entity. So it depends on how you look at it. But you can't say this is the only right definition. Because if you're dealing with something which is multidimensional, or probably out of all dimensions. And therefore, your bet is as good as the others. Only problem is when I say, I'm always right, the other guy is wrong. There is the problem. Because then you're trying to define the undefinable. Mm -hmm. uh, about fear? Fear comes because we don't know what is going to happen. If I go into a situation, or if I go into the dark, there's something there, there's this fear. Then there is fear of death, which is with everybody, which was very evident when the pandemic was around. Before that, for thousands of years, people were saying, oh, there is the fear of death, nobody cared. But now suddenly you came face to face, a person you knew yesterday is gone tomorrow. And then the fear of death comes. So fear is generally about something that you don't know. It comes from uncertainty. It comes with, I don't know what will happen afterwards. There is also, like in, in somebody says there is a ghost in the dark. So you are afraid, you don't want to go there. What is the solution in this particular thing? Go into the dark and prove for yourself that there is no ghost lurking there. So unless you face fear in the face, there is no way you can get free of it. Face it. Now the fear of death. While it's, while it's true that to some extent the fear of death is because uh, we don't know what's going to happen, partly. But the greatest fear of death is because we feel that we have to leave behind 
all things that we consider to be ours. If uh, somebody tells me, well, you're going to die tomorrow, but you can take your wife, you can take your children, you can take your car, you can take <laughs> your house, you can take your bank. Who is afraid of death? <laughs> Suddenly, as I'm going to die, I have to get, I have to leave all these things. So, apart from the unknown, it is the fear of letting go. So, from day one, if you begin to realize that every movement, millions of cells in your body are dying and are being replaced. Ask a medical person. This is inevitable. Or what is created, what is born, will die. Plus, the hope which you get when you read, when you go through the wisdom teachings of the Upanishads and so on, that in us is an entity that doesn't die. It's always there. It's like going from one room to another. I can't prove it to you, can't put it in a test tube, but it's our experience that the death takes place in the body. And also, if you keep dying to desires every day, then you are not afraid of dying in the final reckoning. This is one of the greatest fears. What will happen? I live. Or I have been okay, but my children, what will happen to them? They might be grown up, married, they have their own, but still I am caught in that. Mm -hmm. So, in a way, we should set ourselves free from this. I'm not saying you shouldn't love your kids, you know, I'm not saying that. Or that the husband shouldn't love the wife, or the wife shouldn't love them. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm saying the ultimate sense, we should live with the awareness that extinction of life is possible any moment. And therefore, rejoice. And I say rejoice doesn't mean go into a bar and get drunk. This is not what I'm talking <laughs> People have different definitions of rejoice. <laughs> Wake up with a terrible headache the next day. But I'm not talking about that. Somebody asked someone, is life worth living? They said it depends on the liver. <laughs> I think for the time being, we need to wind up now. It's 7 o'clock. I've been sitting here from 5.30, roughly. Ten minutes late, maybe. But you know what? I enjoy the satsangs in, the, in this victory theater. Uh, now it's two years since I came, but every time we had. I don't know how you do it or uh, what happens, but I find people are seriously interested in what's going on. <laughs> this is important. Otherwise, I get bored and I lose energy. Now I'm full of energy. <laughs> right? Mm. So I'll just go on to the next McDonald's and have some donuts and coffee. Joke. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Peace.